Okay. I know that you would love to stay here all afternoon and listen to that piano music, but uh, we better make a start. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Bill MacDonald from Perth, and my co-chair is Grace Kong, a local girl from Melbourne. Uh, and welcome to the AANMS, AANMS um, Registrar's Award session. Uh, we have eight uh, presentations for you today, uh, uh, an interesting selection of uh, subjects and titles. Uh, and um, just to the speakers, um, because we're uh, running on a fairly tight time schedule, um, we may have to uh, pull the rug on you uh, if you go over time so that everyone else gets their moment in the sun. Uh, so please try and keep to time. Uh, and uh, without further ado, then, uh, we'll start off with the first session, uh, which is by uh, Shankar Vamadevan, uh, FDG PET-CT, for the detection of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumours in paediatric patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. Thank you for the introduction. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is a neurocutaneous syndrome which is due to the deletion or mutation of the NF1 gene and its incidence is approximately 1 in 2500. Its clinical features are various but the plexiform neurofibroma is patonomic for NF1. It is a benign nerve sheet tumor and there is an 8 to 13 percent lifetime risk of malignant transformation to a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Unfortunately, malignant nerve sheet tumors have a very poor five-year survival and clinically it is difficult to differentiate between a benign plexiform neurofibroma and a malignant nerve sheet tumor. As both these lesions enlarge over time and are painful. MRI is good at defining the size and extent of the lesion, but it is suboptimal in assessing malignant transformation. FTG PET CT does play a role, role in assessment. Ferner et al. analyzed 105 adult patients, of which there were 116 lesions. 29 of these were malignant nerve sheet tumors. They found that there was a good sensitivity and specificity when the SUV max was more than 3.5, provided the lesion was painful. However, between an SUV max of 2.5 and 3.5, there was an overlap between benign and malignant lesions. The data in children is limited, but Sai et al. found that 20 children that had 27 lesions, in these patients, they found that a cutoff of an SUV max of more than 4.0 had a good sensitivity and reasonable specificity in assessing malignant transformation. Tumor SUV max to liver SUV mean ratio has also been used in adult patients in assessing malignant transformation. Solomon et al. analyzed 49 adults who had 18 malignant lesions and they found a tumor to liver ratio of more than 2.6 had a good sensitivity and reasonable specificity in assessing malignant transformation. The aims of the analysis was to assess the value of multiple semi-quantitative measures as well as volumetric measures in this, in this topic. We analyzed SUV max, SUV mean which was isocontoured to a percentage of the SUV max, metabolic tumor volume, as well as lesion total glycolytic volume, as well as ratio of uh, tumor to liver SUV mean and SUV max of the tumor to SUV mean of mediastinal blood pool. This was a retrospective analysis um, between July 2006 and May 2015, and only patients that had histological confirmation of benign or malignant tumors were included. These are the details of the PET scanner used, particularly whole body imaging vertex to toes were utilized and the uptake time was 60 minutes. Delayed imaging was performed four hours post, but this analysis only focuses on the results at 60 minutes post uptake time. These are the CT parameters used. The images were analyzed on a Siemens Singovia workstation by a single reader, myself who had access to the clinical information of the patient as well as the formal report of the PET scan. Qualitative analysis was based on any focal increased FDG uptake above background in a soft tissue lesion. A manually placed ellipsoid volume of interest was 
placed over the lesion. In this uh, patient, it was a benign plexiform neurofibroma. The volume of interest then conforms according to the metabolic activity, and semi-quantitative measures were extracted, and the ratios were computed. This is an example of a patient with a malignant nerve sheet tumor. Non-parametric testing was uh, utilized, and a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant in this analysis. 10 patients were recruited, of which there were 14 lesions. 11 or 79% were benign plexiform neurofibromas, and three were malignant nerve sheet tumors. The age range was between five months to 15 years. These are the characteristics of the patients in terms of age, location, histology, and SUV max. In terms of the SUV max, as you can see from the scatter plot, the range for the malignant nerve sheet tumor was between 4.2 to 7.45, and the highest SUV max for a benign tumor was approximately 5.4. So there was some overlap between these two groups, which conforms with previous literature. We also found that the tumor to liver ratio and the tumor to mediastinal blood pool ratio was significantly higher in the malignant nerve sheet tumor group and as compared to the benign group, and it was statistically significant. SUV mean isocontoured to a percentage of SUV max was also significantly higher in the malignant group as compared to the benign group. However, volumetric measures, including metabolic tumor volume and lesion total glycolysis, was not found to be different in this group. In essence, we found SUV max to be helpful. However, there was an overlap between the two groups. The ratios of tumor to liver and tumor to mediastinal blood pool were also found to be helpful in assessing malignant transformation. However, volumetric measures, including met metabolic tumor volume, which is an assessment of the volume of the lesion as opposed to the SUV max, which assesses only the hottest pixel in the lesion. And lesion total glycolysis, which is a product of the SUV mean and the metabolic tumor volume, which gives a representation of the tumor burden. In these two volumetric measures, in this analysis, we did not find it to be helpful. The limitations of this study include the small sample size. We only had three patients that had a malignant tumor. The imaging tool that we used, um, despite being good, was not comprehensive enough in certain cases to include the whole lesion, given the geographic distribution of the lesion in certain patients. And it was a retrospective analysis uh, based from a single center. In terms of future directions, we would like to analyze further the value of delayed imaging as has been seen in the literature. Here is an example of a six-year-old girl with a left proximal forearm lesion with an SUV max of 3.460 minutes post-administration. And on delayed imaging at four hours, it had increased to 5.46. These are the references used. Um, and that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shankar. Are there any questions from the audience? If not, then I've got a couple. Um, so uh, these are children who have a lifelong condition. Uh, you're proposing that FDG PET might be helpful in picking those who have malignant transformation, but that size characteristics and growth of the tumour are not particularly helpful at that. Uh, who would you imagine should be selected for FDG PET imaging and how frequently, given that these are uh, paediatric patients, although most of them are adolescents, I noticed? Currently, many of these patients uh, do have uh, plexiform neurofibromas, but in patients where the plexiform neurofibromas start to become more painful and are growing particularly aggressively, these are the patients that may benefit more from FDG PET, particularly when the MRI or CT is not as good at uh, confirming uh, malignant transformation. And um, the reason why we would consider FDG PET is because obtaining histological confirmation via biopsy can be difficult at times, and surgical removal of the lesion can also be difficult. That is, it may be difficult to remove the whole lesion without morbid outcomes. Paul. And 
you had delayed data, but you, do you have any insight into what the delayed data shows? Uh, so the, yeah. the issue with our analysis is given the time that we recruited the patients, uh, delayed imaging hadn't been used in all patients. And of this cohort, only two patients had delayed imaging. Um, and so we couldn't really analyze it further, unfortunately. But uh, that paper by Wobby et al. was quite helpful. Yes. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you very much for your presentation. Shanta. Thank you. Okay, then we welcome the second presenter, Dr. Shane Lee. Shane onto the stage and uh, he will be presenting his work <coughs> on evaluation of clinical risk factors which may predict regional, nodal and metastatic disease on gallium PSMA PET CT. Thank you Shane. <coughs> Thank you Grace. Um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Shane Lee and this is my project entitled uh, Evaluation of Clinical Risk Factors which may predict regional, nodal, metastatic disease on gallium 68 PSMA PET CT. Sorry, it's not clicking. <clears throat> PSMA PET has taken off recently owing to its superiority to CT and MRI, particularly in the setting of biochemical recurrence. However, PSMA PET is also being used for staging and restaging of disease. Sorry, the clicker's not working very well. <clears throat> There have been studies which compare uh, PSA and previous treatments with overall positivity of PSMA PET but were not specific for location of disease. Other studies have compared PSA and Gleason score with site-specific disease, however did not investigate previous treatments as a predictor. We did not find any data investigating previous treatments as a predictor for location-specific disease. Our aim was to identify clinical risk factors that may predict positivity of PSMA scan PSMA avid local disease, nodal disease, and metastatic disease with clinical parameters such as PSA, PSA doubling time, PSA velocity, Gleason score, radical prostatectomy, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and androgen deprivation therapy. We collected data from all the clinical PSMA scans available to date and um, retrieved patient data from the hospital electronic medical records. Statistical analysis was performed using STATA 13.1. We identified 177 patients or scans, uh, 155 were restaging scans and 22 were staging scans. We analysed them separately due to expected differences between patient population and disease profile. First we'll discuss, discuss the uh, restaging scans of which 62% were positive. We performed a univariate followed by a multivariate logistic regression analysis for overall positivity of the scan and found that only PSA correlated significantly with a positive scan. For chemotherapy, all four patients who had chemotherapy had a positive scan. Um, and so despite having a perfect prediction, we felt that the, uh, the small group size made the uh, results um, unlikely to be significant. Post-estimate predictions of our multivariate logistic regression analysis demonstrated there was a 44% detection rate at very low PSA levels, climbing to about 100% at 35 micrograms per litre. There, there was a linear relationship between PSA of 0 and 10, with a 3.5% increase in probability for every increase in microgram per litre of PSA. Absence of prostatectomy was the only association for PSMA avid local disease the negative coefficient translating to the absence of prostatectomy being the predictor. Post-estimation <coughs> post predictions demonstrated 50% probability of local disease in the absence of prostatectomy versus 10% probability with prostatectomy. For nodal disease, PSA and Gleason score were the only statistically significant associations. Increased PSA and higher Gleason scores were associated with increased probability of PSMA avid nodal disease. For metastatic disease, PSA, Gleason score, radiotherapy and the absence of androgen deprivation therapy were associated with PSMA avid metastatic disease. The probability of metastatic disease increased with PSA and a high Gleason score. 
radiotherapy and the absence of androgen deprivation therapy had increased probability of identifying PSMA avid metastatic disease. We sub-analyzed PSA doubling time and velocity given there were significant confounding factors for PSA in the multivariate analysis. However, no statistically significant results were identified. In the 22 patients who had the staging scan, neither PSA or Gleason score predicted scan positivity, local disease, nodal disease, or metastatic disease. We have independently demonstrated that a higher PSA level predicts a positive PSMA scan. There was a 44% probability of positive scan at very low PSA levels, which is in keeping with a meta-analysis performed by Pereira. However, our gradient of probability was much less dramatic than the meta-analysis. We account for this by heterogeneity of our patient groups, of which um, many of had restaging scans for known metastatic disease and had very high PSA levels. This may have stretched our predictions over a larger PSA range. Our data is not specific for a single indication, but more likely reflects uh, experiences of an everyday clinical workload. Prior radiotherapy was associated with increased probability of detecting metastatic disease. This was clearly not a causative relationship, but more likely due to patient selection. Patients who received radiotherapy may have had more advanced cancer um, than their counterparts, or may have received radiotherapy as first-line management. We showed that an the absence of androgen deprivation therapy was associated with increased probability of metastatic disease. However, this contradicts studies which have demonstrated that ADT was associated with a positive PSMA scan. Studies have shown that PSMA is upregulated with short-term ADT therapy, but downregulated with long-term ADT therapy. Our classification of ADT did not specify if ADT was current or previous or past, uh, nor was the duration of treatment recorded. Given so many unknowns about ADT in our patient cohort, the ADT results were felt to be unlikely <coughs> unreliable uh, despite being statistically significant. In conclusion, PSA was the most significant predictor for overall positivity of PSMA scan, nodal disease and metastatic disease. We demonstrated a near linear relationship between PSA levels and probability of positive restaging scan. We found that a higher Gleason score was associated with nodal and metastatic disease. And finally, amongst all the therapies that we analysed against location-specific disease, we have demonstrated that the absence of prostatectomy was predictive of local disease and radiotherapy was a statistically significant independent predictor of PSMA avid metastatic disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. Are there any questions from the floor, please? No questions? All clear? Yes? What's your definition of positive? Uh, of a positive scan? Um, any detectable disease within the, the body, any, any detectable um, PSMA avid disease. Anything about the background? Or did you use any definition? Um, no, there was no specific cutoff. I guess it was uh, it, the, the scans were reported by. Uh, senior clinicians and it was uh, based on their call. There was no histological confirmation to, s to say that it was disease. Um, it was the, the, the class that classification was just purely the, um, I, guess, I guess the detection of disease um, or, or the perceived, perceived uh, presence of disease on the, on the scan. On, in the restage, in primary staging, um, the I, I guess we, we all we, we know that there is a um, the presence of disease. This is before they've been operated on or had any therapy whatsoever. Um, I, I think the the sensitivity of PSMA um, it, it just reflects the, how sensitive it is in terms of those those scans um, that we're able to detect. Um, the, the known disease as well as the, the nodal disease and, and metastatic disease that's present in those staging scans. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any more questions from the floor? Otherwise, I think Bill has a question. 
Uh, did you look at the duration uh, or the interval since biochemical relapse? Because presumably the patients with high PSMA levels had had a longer interval since uh, their biochemical relapse and the performing of the imaging. Uh, I guess where I'm getting to is, is how do we select who should be studied with a PSMA PET scan? Everyone with a biochemical relapse or, or is there a, a point at which you would say, well, um, we, we won't scan these patients now, but we'll scan them in six months' time? Um. Most people in the room, I think, would probably advocate that everyone should have Jeez. PSMA PET scans that, that's, all, that's <laughs> all the time. That's what I was going uh, to say. The, um, uh, I think certainly where the, when there is evidence yeah. of biochemical relapse, the, mm. the, 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 the studies have shown that mm. it's, clear, it's clearly uh, a good test to identify and, and restage the disease at that point to identify mm. where to direct treatment from, from there on in. Um, but some patients would presumably have had relapse for a long time and others not. Correct. I think I think the, the, the that that's probably re related to, I mean, a, a very low, essentially a, a PSA of close to zero, barely detectable mm. PSA levels. We're already seeing forty four percent positivity of scans, and I wonder whether that PSMA, um, whether PSMA may actually be more sensitive. Yeah, I mean, it, it has to start from zero somewhere theoretically, and whether the PSMA scan may. May, event, may actually be more sensitive in, in that sense to, to de using, PSM, uh, using PSA as a screening tool. Obviously, I don't think that's um, uh, financially uh, going to be the case. Um, I don't really have a, 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 a uh, in, in terms of delaying a PSMA scan, I, I, I think as long as there's biochemical recurrence, there's good evidence that the PSMA scan should be performed. Uh, as, as soon as possible, really. To, um, th there's not really much benefit, I would think, to delay it six months or a year. Thank you, Shane, for Thank the you. interest of time. I think we'll uh, Thank you. move along to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Shane. Okay, the next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Chris Fesser. And he's going to be presenting an audit of unfunded studies in a new positron emission tomography CT facility. Uh, hi, my name's Chris. I'm currently a uh, registrar at Bankstown Hospital, but previous to, uh, before that I was working at St George Hospital where they put in a new PET facility uh, in 2017. And during the course, um, the vast majority of the cases that are reported were funded by uh, Medicare. However, towards the end of the year, there was a growing number of cases uh, which were not funded by Medicare. I took a bit of interest in that and wanted to further explore uh, the cases which we uh, came across. Um, and uh, I took a very interest in the, the background, the economic issues in regards to that. Uh, it's also very important for a department to understand the referral pattern. Uh, it fosters uh, per, uh, professional relationships, maximises the clinical relevance of the reports, guides CPD uh, for the diagnostician and the clinician as well. And it's uh, uh, very important to understand the trends and volumes uh, occurring in the department. Um, and I took a very big interest in the economic issue in regards to PET and also uh, whether these unfunded studies did make a difference to the patient themselves. Uh, what I did was a retrospective uh, audit looking at the monthly billings and I recorded the unfunded PET studies. Um, I characterised them in terms of their clinical question, the underlying pathology and the number of previous PET studies. And I also reviewed the uh, previous reports and imaging. I looked at uh, three private uh, local facilities in the St George area to collate the previous reports and they were, reported by my, uh, they were reviewed by myself. So in regards to the clinical question, uh, the vast majority were, um, the clinical question was assessment of treatment response, followed by equivocal radiology, staging, uh, worsening clinical symptoms, uh, raising, clinical raising tumor markers, and query malignancy. And this is a graph just illustrating those results. In regards to pathology, the uh, most common pathologies were breast cancer, followed by pancreatic cancer, 
and hepatobiliary. And these are the uh, results in graph form. In regards to previous pets, so the vast majority had not had a previous pet study and 15 cases did have a uh, previous uh, pet and only one or two had uh, two or greater. Let's see, graph form. Uh, now, what I then did was I removed the cases that were uh, query uh, were equivocal radiology cases, and then I subcategorized the remaining findings into whether they had additional findings, were stable, or had improved findings when compared to the previous uh, radiology. And the majority of the cases actually had additional findings, which were clinically, which were deemed relevant. I'll just go through a few quick examples, and it comes up very well. Um, oh, this shows uh, an adrenal lesion, three centimetres involving the left adrenal. The CT and MRI reports were equivocal, whereas this did not show significant FTG uptake and uh, was most likely and was reported as benign. Uh, this is a further example. The clinical history was the there was thickening of the gallbladder, uh, query of malignant process on the CT. On the PET imaging, this shows that there's no uh, thickening of the gallbladder wall and no FDG uptake and was reported as normal. A case uh, illustrating additional findings. Uh, this is marked thickening of the uh, gallbladder uh, antrum, uh, which was biopsied and consistent with, uh, due, uh, with uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, three months later, uh, the PET, uh, PET were performed showing local disease, but also um, liver disease. Uh, supracubicular lymphadenopathy and also uh, parioidic lymphadenopathy. Uh, another case uh, within a nine-month nine period, patient had a, a Whipple's procedure for a, a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which was removed. Six, uh, nine months later, there was a recurrence at the site uh, demonstrating FDG uptake, and this was uh, subsequently biopsied and proven to be recurrence of the um, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, CT, scan demonstra uh, CT scan in a patient with memory loss and expressive dysphasia. Initial CT was reported as normal with some, uh, with some very minor uh, volume loss. However, the uh, PET imaging uh, demonstrates that there's hyperperfusion of the frontal and temporal regions and suggestive of frontal temporal dementia. Discussion points I wanted to, wanted to raise is there's growing evidence in um, research in, in patients in um, conditions where it's currently unfunded with Medicare. Uh, and also this may uh, impact uh, patient, uh, patient management and also patient um, a response to treatment. Um, a classic example of that is the St. George uh, Hospital. There's a, a neuroendocrine department which they currently use uh, the PET uh, FDG studies to see if there's any de-differentiation in the tumours. Um, and this is then altered uh, management. Uh, discussion, other discussion points I wanted to raise is having multiple uh, imaging can also increase the risk of patient stress and also increase the risk, risk of detecting incidentalomas. Um, and also that PET CT has been actually used quite judiciously given the fact that um, the vast majority of patients had not had previous PET imaging. Um, limitations, uh, being a retrospective uh, study, um, the key finding, um, the, it was clinical utility has not been established given that uh, my study was looking at additional findings as opposed to whether this actually made a, a significant, significant difference to the patient's management. Uh, and also, it's very difficult to compare what uh, the findings and PET compared with previous imaging given that the scans were done at different time points. And there's my references. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Any questions from the audience? I think all of us who work in pet centres would have experience with uh, the volume of requests for unfunded scans. It's a significant management problem, uh, one which we're hoping to discuss with the federal government. So the additional findings, how did you verify uh, what they might have been? So in terms of additional findings, I looked at uh, imaging that the patient had done within St George uh, Public Hospital, 
also within three other individual, three other radiology centres in close proximity to the mm -hmm. uh, St George Hospital. I reviewed all the imaging and also the imaging of the current scan as well and seen whether there was um, findings which uh, were in addition of the uh, current PET uh, compared with prior MRIs or prior PET studies. Do you have any follow-up studies to prove that those lesions are truly positive or truly negative? Well, um, in the, such as the case I showed in regards to the recurrent pancreatic adenocarcinoma, there were some that were biopsied and were proven to, to be recurrents, uh, whereas others were proven to be benign um, through classic uh, imaging findings. But, but some might not have been biopsied. So did, That's right. Did you, do you have any data on, on what happened to these no, patients with additional findings? That would have been very nice to actually have input from the clinicians in regards to following up on the patients and clearly verifying that these were additional findings um, and with biopsy uh, confirmation. But the only data that I could uh, receive was data that was from the pathology, uh, pathology reports and also the uh, clinical imaging. But it would be nice to have input from the clinicians. I've also got one question. I understand that you have a list of uh, unfunded cases, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, yes. etc. Um, did you look into the breakup in, within those individual subtypes or tumour groups, uh, the utility or incremental value of PET in, in all those subtypes? Uh, I didn't specifically look at that area, but what I found was quite interesting looking at the uh, subtypes, especially breast cancer, uh, and was that the current research in terms of what the utility of PET uh, is in these conditions actually doesn't equal to what the referral base is. Uh, for instance, in uh, breast cancer, for instance, a lot of research in terms of staging of stage one, stage two and stage three disease uh, for the utility of PET. But the vast majority of responses in the breast cancer uh, arm were actually a query response to treatment. So it actually varied uh, quite a bit. Peter. Um, you mentioned some of the indications that back up by access in the literature. Yes. Did you, did you have any sort of, did you speak to your referrals about what do you think in terms of labor references? Not strong, leading, or not preserved? Uh, that would have, it would have been really nice to actually get input, as I said, um, to get input from the clinicians in regards to that. Uh, given a retrospective order, it was quite uh, difficult to do that. Um, but if you review the literature behind, for instance, the breast cancer, uh, it sometimes uh, doesn't collate with the uh, recent, uh, with evidence-based um, what's happening in the literature and what's actually happening on a clinician uh, diagnostician level. So it can be a little bit different. Um, I, I didn't in regards to that was, but one of the uh, key referral questions was uh, rising uh, clinical uh, tumour markers. So I found that one of the reasons why the clinicians would be referring the cases was because of increasing tumour markers. And based on my limited uh, audit was that given an increase in tumour markers does actually um, would uh, more would predict uh, a greater chance of having additional findings on this on the imaging. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, uh, we're out much. of time now, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay. Welcome the next speaker, Dr. Labib Rahman. I think Labib is presenting oh. next. <laughs> Do you want to go first? <laughs> you're, too, you're too keen. <laughs> you're next. Yeah. Okay, Labib is going to present to us a high accuracy of negative gallium PSMA PET CT in excluding local lymph node metastases in, in, in intermediate to high risk primary prostate cancer, a single center experience with histopathologic confirmation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, there's been a lot of enthusiasm um, uh, for uh, PSMA PET scanning by some of the clinicians managing prostate cancer at our center. 
and uh, and no doubt with an unusually high number of people in this building as well. Uh, this study attempts to understand some of the reasoning behind that enthusiasm and assess the diagnostic performance of the study and in a more broader sense try and try and see if we can uh, glean any understanding of how it might inform surgical management of patients in pr the primary setting. Briefly, I do need to acknowledge that uh, funding for some of the PSMA PET scans was provided by uh, AstraZeneca. So despite its high prevalence, um, uh, there remain a number of management controversies in prostate cancer. In appropriately selected patients, Surgery with radical prostatectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection and or additional multimodal therapies potentially offers cure. The guidelines highlight the, ac the importance of accurate lymph node staging um, in terms of the therapeutic and prognostic implications for these patients, but up to 80% of lymph nodes are smaller than the 8 millimeter size-based uh, detection threshold of conventional imaging strategies. In lieu of histopathology, management often relies on nomogram-based risk scores. Prostate-specific membrane antigen is a metalloenzyme. It's a type 2 transmembrane protein which is expressed more strongly in advanced prostate uh, cancers and can be imaged by radio-labeled enzyme inhibitors targeting the extracellular domain. 98% of lymph node metastases express PSMA. Existing studies in the primary staging setting have suggested that PSMA PET scan demonstrates particularly strong specificity. Within the cohort of, of uh, intermediate to high risk primary prostate cancers, our aim was to determine the diagnostic efficacy of PSMA PET scanning in pelvic lymph node staging, and more broadly to understand how the scan may inform decisions uh, when it comes to offering surgery. So we conducted a retrospective review of consecutive urologist referred patients who were of uh, intermediate to high risk um, uh, stratification who were scanned between October 2015 and October 2017. We used the European Association of Urology risk groups for biochemical recurrence and localized, uh, of localized and locally advanced prostate cancer because they're widely accepted um, in, and adopted in Australian clinical practice as part of the risk stratification process. We then selected those patients that uh, went on to have surgery. These were our scan parameters. We used the common gallium 68 labeled ligand and routinely administered intravenous uh, uh, fruzamide at the time of injection. The studies were performed on a GE time of flight PET camera with low dose thick slice non contrast CTs. Our scans were interpreted by the consensus reading of two experienced nuclear medicine physicians who were blinded to previous clinical imaging and histopathologic data. The interpretation was standardized uh, to the criteria suggested by uh, Fanti et al. And a third reader was available to resolve any discordant findings. Data was analyzed uh, descriptively in this study. So we were referred a total of uh, 78 patients for primary staging by urologists. And as you can see, an important cohort that we didn't discuss further in this study was the significant number of patients who were upstaged by uh, the detection of distant metastatic disease. However, an interesting and unique feature of the 19 patients who proceeded to surgery in our study uh, was that they were almost, almost entirely um, had no scan evidence of uh, lymph node or distant metastatic disease. What's more, in this table you can see that all but one of our patients were actually stratified to the high risk category, and that was predominantly on the basis that was predominantly on the basis of the Gleason score. So when these patients were taken to surgery, uh, none of the patients actually uh, in this study had demonstrated histopathologic evidence of lymph node disease. In total, 141 of 142 retrieved lymph nodes were accurately identified as negative for disease, achieving a specificity of 99%. Uh, this meant that 18 of the 19 patients were accurately staged according to the uh, PSMA uh, PET scan. Taken as a whole, our findings would suggest that within this cohort of patients who would conventionally be stratified as high risk, a negative PSMA PET scan appeared to further subselect a group that was less likely to have lymph node involvement and therefore may be more amenable to surgery. So these are 
um, actually, we also identified uh, one patient who had um, unsuspected bilateral seminal vesicle involvement, which uh, was confirmed uh, on uh, histopathology. These are a couple of the, of the useful images uh, from our study. This first slide actually demonstrates the single falsely positive lymph node in our study, which was a four millimeter mildly PSMA avid right internal iliac lymph node, which demonstrated a maximum standardized uptake value of 4.1. The, uh, this second image is, um, the, uh, demonstrates a patient who had unsuspected bilateral seminal vesicle involvement, uh, which can be an important factor when it comes to surgical planning and decision making. There are a number of important considerations when interpreting the, uh, our, the findings of our study. Firstly, despite our initial intentions, our cohort, our cohort was almost entirely high-risk patients, bar one, and this likely reflected the greater confidence of clinicians in proceeding directly to a definitive therapy uh, without further uh, staging scans. Secondly, since a large number of patients, both with scan positive and scan negative disease, never proceeded to surgery, we were unable to ascertain the sensitivity of the study uh, of the scan or the overall accuracy of the scan. A potential surrogate gold standard marker in lieu of histopathology may be to look at PSA remission in these patients and long-term data outcomes. Thirdly, PSMA PET scans are more subjectively interpreted than FDG PET, where the blood pool and liver activity are often used as internal reference standards. <laughs> at our particular center, we had, uh, we had two very experienced nuclear medicine physicians interpreting the scans. Um, and uh, and we, we attempted to, to use some sort of standardization of the interpretation criteria where there is no sort of universally accepted uh, criteria. On the other hand, we must acknowledge that, uh, that we had not formally standardized the pelvic lymph node dissection templates performed by the surgeons, although it is worth mentioning that uh, the existing guidelines do suggest that all patients with uh, high-risk disease undergo extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Uh, with any uh, PET scan, the, there is an intrinsic limitation to the spatial resolution, and that, that could also play a factor in this study. And finally, our study, um, uh, our CT and diuretic protocols uh, may vary from the practices at other centers, which may influence uh, their outcomes. So in summary, our experience has been concordant with the previous findings that have demonstrated a strong specificity for PSMA PET scanning for pelvic lymph node uh, metastases. Importantly, our study appeared to uh, demonstrate that a negative PSMA PET scan uh, may, uh, may select a subgroup of patients who are conventionally considered high risk, um, but who are more suitable to surgery than the current paradigm of, exi of existing risk nomograms may suggest. Um, given that the uh, literature sort of estimates that high risk patients would have an incidence of between 15 to 40 percent of uh, uh, of uh, pelvic lymph node involvement. We sort of we felt that there was a signal that uh, we may be able to use PSMA PET scans to uh, better select um, some of these patients, and this and in the future we may see uh, some of this uh, reflected in um, in guidelines. Finally, um, follow up for PSMA, PSA remission and long term outcome data would be the next step in evaluating these patients and in evaluating those patients that did not proceed to surgery. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the assistance of our data manager, Dr. Ken Lai. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for the presentation. <coughs> Any questions, please? Do you have one? Yes, so uh, the guidelines currently recommend pelvic lymph node dissection for men with high risk disease. That's right. Your study has shown that when the scan's negative, you don't find involved nodes. So, do you think the guidelines should be changed so that pelvic lymph node dissection is only performed in men with positive scans? And if that is the case, that they do have a positive scan. Should they still have surgery? That's an interesting question. I wouldn't change the guidelines on the basis of this study alone. Um, but 
the gold standard does still remain um, histopathology, and I do think that PSMA PET scans will still potentially miss you know, micros uh, microscopic metastatic disease that may be below the detection threshold. So although our experience was very positive, I would be very cautious about saying that on that basis you should then say that no patients, you know, high-risk patients should not, uh, should not uh, undergo extended pelvic lymph node dissection. But certainly, as I said, it, I think that beyond the existing risk nomograms, this, this does help. But this may help subselect a group that may benefit from, uh, uh, that may be candidates for surgery or may be more amenable to surgery where the initial decision may have been to err on the side of alternative therapies. Yes. So I've got a question if hmm. nobody has one. Um, one of the limitations is only a small proportion of patients in that negative PSMA group actually proceeded to surgery. Um, so based on your results, has it actually changed your local practice at all? The results of the PSMA uh, scan, I do ha well have, according to our urologist, changed some of their practice just in terms, mostly actually in, um, with respect to excluding uh, surgery for patients who might have otherwise been offered surgery. So I mentioned that there were the 13 patients who actually had upstage disease. So a lot of those patients are not offered surgery. Um, I think otherwise the scan tends to just increase their confidence that <coughs> surgery is a viable therapeutic option. Well, the questions, thank you very much for your presentation. Now it's the turn of Dr. Robert Corr, uh, and uh, he's going to be talking about the non-invasive assessment of acute graft versus host disease of the GI tract following allogeneic hemopoietic stem cell transplantation using FDG PET. Great, great, thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm here. Almost sold out crowd. I like it. Um, okay. So uh, acute graft versus host disease uh, is a very common and serious condition following stem cell transplant. Um, as you may know, it's a condition where the donor lymphocytes attack the host cells and it affects the skin and the gastrointestinal tract most commonly, uh, but also the liver. And the mainstay of diagnosis is based on um, histological diagnosis and that's often acquired uh, via endoscopy. Uh, in gastrointestinal GVHD. And uh, the mortality rate from uh, endoscopy has been reported as high as 1.8% uh, in these patients. In terms of what's in this area for PET and GVHD at the moment, there are only two small studies. Uh, this is probably the better one of them, where they looked at 30 patients, around half of whom had GVHD, uh, and they reported a negative predictive value of about 81% and a positive predictive value of 100%, which is amazing. Uh, this is the second study which showed, looked at 42 patients and they reported a negative predictive value of 96%, uh, but I go into more uh, detail about that in the manuscript. So in terms of uh, what we did, we thought, uh, look, the mortality rate is not insignificant in these patients. So we thought if we could uh, provide objective criteria in PET uh, for calling a PET negative for GVHD in particular, then maybe we could uh, obviate the need for some of these endoscopies and thus reduce the risk to these patients. So our study looked at 51 patients uh, with clinically suspected GVHD. They underwent uh, prospectively, so PET and endoscopy, of both the upper and lower GI tract. Uh, and now we asked our endoscopists to take biopsies of eight segments. So we divided the upper GIT segment uh, sorry, into the esophagus, stomach and duodenum, and the lower GIT into uh, terminal ileum, um, ascending colon and cecum, transverse colon, uh, descending colon, and sigmoid colon slash rectum. Now they took two to four biopsies of each segment, regardless of whether the PET was positive or negative, and regardless of whether macroscopic assessment was positive or negative. Um, so very robust uh, histological data in terms of serial biopsies. Now this is an example of uh, how we would assess the PETs, and use, just using a planar ROI over uh, the visually most intense uh, part of a segment, and we did this for each of the eight segments that we were talking about before, and we also took uh, planar ROI over the ascending aorta as a measure of mediastinal blood pool. From these two parameters, we generated ratios, um, so SUV max of the gastrointestinal tract uh, over SUV mean of blood pool. We did look at SUV max, 
um, which uh, is commonly used, but SUV mean uh, is also readily available and provides a lower denominator, so the ratios are spread further apart uh, and help us in differentiating. In terms of the criteria, we thought there were two elements that were important uh, to uh, defining a pet positive. The first was the ratio threshold, so that's the ratio we were talking about before, and it's the number that was uh, required of that ratio to call that segment positive. And then the segment threshold, which we defined as the number of these positive segments, which was required to call the pet positive overall. Uh, now we acknowledge that there was, uh, sorry, there's often inflammatory or physiological activity in uh, the upper GIT, so esophagus or stomach. And so we performed this analysis for eight segments with all these combinations of uh, segment threshold 2 and ratio threshold 1.4, segment threshold 2, you know, uh, ratio threshold of 2. But we did it for eight segments and then we excluded, we previously excluded segments from this uh, analysis. We compared the results of all of this versus uh, any diagnosis of GVHD on histology. And we also uh, looked at other sources of colonic inflammation that might be present, such as infection. Uh, so this is an example of how I would display the data. I can, as you can imagine, there's a massive amount of data to go through. Uh, but this is, for example, uh, five segments. So this is the lower five GIT segments uh, with a segment threshold of two. So remember, two positive segments to call the whole PET positive. In the first column, you can see that I've varied the ratio threshold between one and three. So there's a lot of permutations of uh, these parameters. And then I've calculated the, the diagnostic accuracy or diagnostic characteristics of each of these combinations. And this is probably the salient slide because uh, the highest negative predictive value um, we could get with our data was 85%. We'll come back to that later. In terms of our histology, uh, 45 of our patients, 45 or 51, had both gastroscopy and colonoscopy. So once again, very robust serial data, which is not often seen uh, in the literature. 21 of these patients had GVHD. And of these, uh, notably, 18 had upper gastrointestinal tract GVHD. Now, all of these patients also had lower GIT involvement. Um, and put a different way, none of our patients had isolated upper GIT GVHD. Uh, so very interesting incidental finding on our result uh, on our study. Uh, now this is just the criteria again. So only looking at the five lower segments were the ideal criteria. Uh, ratio segment, oh, sorry, ratio threshold of two of of apologize. Ratio threshold of one point four and a segment threshold of two. And these are the results we were able to achieve uh, with those criteria. And most notably, a negative predictive value of ninety five percent, albeit at a bit of cost of specificity there. In terms of the two false negatives you've seen there, uh, one patient was being treated with methylprednisolone already with four cutaneous GVHD, and the other patient only had very minor histological changes uh, on biopsy. Uh, notably, both were macroscopically normal on endoscopy, so endoscopy was no better than PET in these situations. So ours uh, is the largest prospective PET and GVHD trial out there uh, with very robust serial biopsy data. Um, the negative predictive value suggests that PET is a useful tool in the assessment of GVHD. And in particular, if no two of the lower five GIT segments uh, show a ratio greater than 1.4, then endoscopy may not be required in these patients. Uh, however, the low specificity of PET still uh, says that endoscopy is necessary in uh, PET positive patients. Um, the incidental finding suggests uh, of the upper and lower GIT, so con contemporaneous uh, involvement of the lower GIT whenever the upper GIT was involved, uh, suggests that endoscopy is not necessary in the assessment of GVHD. And this is really important because this essentially halves the number of endoscopies that we perform on these uh, patients who are often uh, critically unwell. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, so the next step in our little progression is uh, looking at implementation of PET uh, CT in the assessment of GIT GVHD at our center and, and just monitoring to see how this affects our routine clinical practice. Another part of the study that uh, we haven't gone into uh, at the moment is that uh, serum or blood was taken at the time of the PET study uh, for inflammatory cytokines which have shown some promise in GVHD assessment as well and we're trying to, uh, we'll, we will be looking at combining the PET CT results with these cytokines uh, in order to uh, try and improve our diagnostic accuracy. I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, Marion and EH Flack Trust uh, and the Alfred Foundation for helping to fund the study. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Robert. Uh, any questions from the audience? Paul. 
Oh, this is a really interesting paper. Thanks very much for presenting that. Thanks. Um, our hematologists always struggle with graft versus host disease, and I guess one of the dilemmas they have is that if you've got graft versus host disease, you have to increase the immunosuppression, but if you've got an infective cause, you, you obviously don't want to do that. So they're kind of opposite therapeutic approaches. Yes. Um, you also acquired information on infection and CMV. Did you look at that data as well to see if you might you know, the FDG parameters were different in infective causes versus host disease? Uh, look, I think that's uh, very difficult to tell <laughs> because, as we know, in any inflammatory disorder will uh, cause the SUV to come up. Um, I think the value of PET is in the negative predictive value because if it's positive, we can't tell what it is and they, all, they always need to go to biopsy or endoscopy. Um, so we've focused on the negative predictive value. Um, we did look at whether the uh, segments were a higher um, FDG uptake in inflammatory causes or, um, uh, or GVHD compared to non-GVHD segments, but we haven't exactly looked at the, uh, uh, sorry, the GVHD segments first, any other biopsy segments, so sorry, other, any other diagnosis. Robert, were any of your patients taking metformin, and if they were, what did you do about it? Because metformin's a known cause of uh, augmenting yes. FDG uptake. Um, ama amazingly, none of our patients were on metformin uh, when I went through, which was an unbelievable finding. Um, I will go back through the data again, because after, on my second look, I still haven't found anybody on metformin, but I will look again, because uh, it is important. Uh, other, I have noted a few other papers which suggest stopping metformin two or three days before the PET study, which I would probably also suggest in this setting, but I have no, I have no data to comment on whether it affects the accuracy of PET. That can be tricky in patients taking steroids, though, so... Very true. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you very much, Robert. Okay, our next presenter, Dr. Natricorn Deandrevin. So Natricorn will be presenting to us uh, the correlation between MAA and lapidol lung activity and unexpected incongruence in lung uptake. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I started this project last year at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Adelaide. Um, why do I... Sorry, just gonna... Is there something I need to click? Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, hepatocellular carcinoma is the most common liver malignancy worldwide, and its annual incident rate is rising, yet the prognosis remains poor, and there are limited treatment options available. Since SCC exhibit arterial tumoral hypervascularity, intra-arterial radiotherapy uh, allows for delivery of high-dose radiation to the tumor microenvironment with relatively low to toxicity profiles. Iodine-131 lopidol can be used for both adjuvant and palliative therapy. Um, however, there is a risk of radiation-related pneumonitis, which is rare, but can be a serious complication. Workup MAA hepatic breakthrough study can be used as a surrogate marker for lower pyridol distributions. Um, following a hepatic artery injection, it has been estimated that a physiological lung uptake of lapidol is between 10 to 25 percent, and for MAA, it's less than 10 percent. So if the presence of MAA lung activity is greater than 10 percent, it suggests a significant atrovenous shunting, which may suggest that you may need to require, uh, modify your lapidol dose or cancel, cancel the therapy. Recently, at our site, we observed a patient with greater than expected um, lopidol lung activities not predicted on the MAA workup. So this patient initially went, had her um, MAA lung uptake, which demonstrated 3.8% on the planar images on the upper right-hand corner. Um, however, she then proceeded to have her therapy. Um, two weeks following the treatment with the uh, post-therapy scan, which then demonstrated an unexpected 36% low pyridol lung uptake. The aim for this uh, project is to evaluate correlation between percentage MAA and low pyridol lung values, determine frequency of any discrepancies, identify any predictive variables, and determine incident of pneumonitis. 
this is a retrospective analysis of patients receiving both the MAA workup and the lapidal treatment from 2014-2017. We also acquired additional histological data, tumor location, previous resection, presence of cirrhosis on histologies, hepatitis status, as well as follow-up record of the three-month post-therapy. Uh, we used geometric mean to calculate the lung uh, activity for both MAA and lopiodols. However, for patients who received the treatment prior to 2017, uh, no raw data was available, and therefore we created a, a visual assessment scoring system ranging from 0 to 4, which a score of 3 or higher represents significant lung uptake. You can see here, I'm not sure how well it's demonstrated, we score of 3 represents lung activity similar to that of the liver, and score of 4 representing lung activity significantly higher than the liver. Our result, well, we identified 25 patients who received both their MAA workup and their therapies from the 2014-2017. 20 patients received the treatment as adjuvant therapy and 5 patients received it as the palliative therapy. 14 patients had histological evidence of cirrhosis. 16 patients had positive hepatitis at some point in time. And for the adjuvant therapy group, there's an average time between tumor resection and therapy is as about 105 days. We found a weak positive linear relationship between MA lung activity and lopiodol lung activities with a correlation coefficient of values of 0 0.2474. However, we also identified four, pa four patients, 16 percent, who had significant and unexpected iodine-131 lopiodol lung uptake, either to a geometric mean of values of greater than 35 or the visual assessment score of 3 or higher. They all have the lung, MA lung activity less than 10 percent. For those patients who received the treatment in 2017, we calculated um, the geometric mean values and we found that the lapidal lung active range from 10 to 36 percent with a mean value of 20 percent. All four patients with the incongruent lung activity were from the adjuvant therapy groups. The average time between resection and therapy is 90 days for these four patients. Three patients have histological evidence of cirrhosis, which is 21 percent of all the cirrhotic patients. One patient had evidence of marked fibrosis. Three of them have positive hepatitis at some point in time, and one patient have HIV and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, none of the four patients uh, developed a radiation-related pneumonitis, and we also like to mention that we did not observe any discrepancy in lung activity in the palliative therapy group. Uh, we did not identify any definite variable predictive of the MAA and lopiodol lung activity discrepancies, However, we observe a greater proportion of discrepancy lung activity among cirrhotic patients, up to 21%, but our numbers are too small to conclude any definite association. Um, although incomplete, the data on the tumor size and location did not appear to demonstrate correlation with lung activity discrepancies. While we do not have um, tumor vascularity measurement, we did not identify any discrepancy in our palliative therapy group. The average time between MA administration and therapy administration is two weeks, and we did not observe any significant association between the lung discrepancy either. We have considered a few other possibilities which may contribute to the discrepancies. The fact that the MAA and um, the pyridol has different um, intrinsic values between one being a particle and the other one being a doublet, um, emulsified doublet. There's a significant size var variations for MAA from 10 to 150 micrometers. However, the previous data suggests that lopidal doublet size between 10 to 40 micrometers is associated with a high lung uptake. We also should consider the lopidal biological clearance and half-life, and also possibly of a degree of lopidal uh, iodine label breakdown product at the time of the scan. We also consider using low-dose lopidal as a workup study, and we have done in the past at our center. However, that on some occasions, if the patient was not eligible for the treatment, we end up having to waste the dose. So for this method, um, logistic and financial feasibility may be an issue. Um, while we did not observe any cases with uh, radiation-related pneumonitis, it is uncertain what is the theoretical dose for internal radiation to the lung to predict possible pneumonitis. Previous data have suggested following a standard dose of 2.2 gigabit administrations, then estimate a 16% of lapidal lung activities or three grade um, lung dose. Based from this, we deduce that our pa the patient that we observe with a 36% lung activity would have had over six um, grade of lung dose, and that person did not develop any symptoms to suggest of the pneumonitis. The possible mechanism would include the direct radiation toxicities 
as well as immune mediated process, as we know that the risk of uh, pneumonitis does increase with the number of exposures. We also consider the risk of administering subtherapeutic hepatic dose in patients with discordant um, lung uptake. In conclusion, in most cases, workup um, MAA study offer a reliable pre-therapy assessment prior to iodine 131 lopidol treatment in both adjuvant and palliative groups. There's a weak linear positive relationship between um, the MAA and lopidol line activities. However, we did observe an unexpected incongruence of lung uptake in up to 16% of the patients. Um, underlying cirrhosis appears to increase the likelihood of discrepancies. Um, however, the risk of clinically significant radiation-related pneumonitis appears to be low, and the limitation of our study is that there's a small sample size and the limited data available for geo geometric mean calculation. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, any questions, please? Can I start? How did you follow those four patients up? Do they have regular CT scans, or is it just via clinical assessment? Is it imaging? And how long did you follow these patients up? For? Uh, well, our follow-up data are quite limited, um, but we try to follow them up to up to three months um, post therapy, and the, we access their medical records. But for the particular patient, we found. That started the project that we did um, schedule her back for a follow-up in um, a visit. Yes. Another factor that uh, might be worth consideration is that the MAA scans are performed an hour or so after tracer injection, whereas the lipidol scans were performed two weeks after injection. So not only is the physicochemical yes. properties of the two agents yes. different, but the interval between injection two, and yes. uh, imaging is quite different as well. Yes, and um, and we did manage at our side, we try to um, maintain constants as much as possible. Uh, we usually have one interventional radiology to perform the study, and the site of administration of the dose has been quite consistent in terms of whether it's common hepatic or right and left he mm -hmm. hepatic arteries. So what sort of activities are you administering? Uh, the, um, of the lipidol? The lipidol. Um, mm. Depend to is it therapeutic um, patients or a palliative um, uh, group, and we just divided the dose. We started standard of two point two um, a gigabag, and then depend to is it going to be a single injection or do injection into different vessels. Yeah, yeah. but the, of course in the palliative group we do reduce the dose. So is there any feasibility to do some early imaging to see if, in fact, the accumulation in the lungs uh, builds over time? Or, or yes, it, yeah, it mm. would be good to... That would make a big difference to lung dosimetry. Yes, yes, and it would be helpful to identify uh, what is the uh, biological breakdown in the individuals if we do it right after mm. the injection and two weeks follow. Mm. You did mention there was a possibility that it could be um, that could be free. Um, I one three one. Yes. Do you notice any thyroid uptake or? Oh, we did. We did. Uh, even though all of our patients were blocked. Um, if I oh sorry I didn't. Um, there are some of our uh, patients who have the thyroid uptake, but they they were all adequately blocked. But yes, that may suggest that there are free iodine running around. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So it could be multifactorial, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Do mm. any other questions? Well, so we thank you very thank much you. for the presentation. Okay, Dr. Sufei Lee has been patiently waiting, uh, and now it's her turn to tell us all about the utility of MAG3 scintigraphy in the assessment of post-surgical renal transplant complications. Good afternoon. Um, So the major complications such as acute tubular necrosis or rejection may occur post-transplant. Our department um, performs routine post-operative MAG3 scintigraphy on all transplants performed by our centre's kidney care service, which is the second largest transplant service in Australia. However, accuracy of MAG3 scintigraphy in the evaluation of these complications is not well delineated in the literature. Apart from visual qualitative assessment, various quantitative methods have been with calculated indices of perfusion and or uptake have been used previously. Our department uses a 
parameter, the two-minute uptake percent as a semi-quantitative measurement of MAG3 uptake by the kidney. So we performed a retrospective study of the utility of MAG3 scintigraphy in the assessment of post-transplant complications using renal core biopsy as a gold standard with comparison to ultrasound. We also examined the two-minute uptake parameter for any for one, any potential correlation with results of the core biopsy in terms of um, rejection versus non-rejection results, and also any potential correlation with serum creatinine at three months and 12 months. We retrospectively reviewed all MAG3 studies performed between July 2015 and June 2016, alongside available renal ultrasound, biopsy results, and serum creatinine. Major exclusion criteria included if the study was not performed um, under 96 hours before after transplantation, or if there was no available biopsy data available. For the second part of the study, those patients without serum creatinine available um, were also excluded. So patients were divided into three separate groups for analysis based on their date of their first renal biopsy relative to the date of their first MAG3 study. This presentation focuses more on the data from the cohort of Group A, um, those who underwent biopsy at or before seven days after the MAG3 study. So renal blood flow on MAG3 is classically impaired in acute rejection, whereas ATN has been described to have relatively um, preserved perfusion on renal scintigraphy. Thus, we classified abnormal MAG3 perfusion as an indicator for transplant rejection. The two minute uptake parameter was calculated by drawing a ROI over the kidney at two minutes and dividing the kidney ROI counts um, by the injected dose to obtain a percentage of the injected dose. A total of 105 patients fit the um, total inclusion criteria for part one. However, I will be focusing on the results of group A, again, because it had the shortest duration between MAG3 and biopsy. 11 of 30 patients at 37% um, demonstrated abnormal perfusion on the MAG3 study. Five of the 30 patients demonstrated biopsy proven rejection. However, only one of these patients had abnormal MAG3 perfusion. In group A, the negative predictive value for rejection with normal MAG3 perfusion was 79%. However, the positive predictive value for rejection with abnormal perfusion was only 9%. The sensitivity and specificity for abnormal MAG3 perfusion for biopsy proven rejection was 20% and 60% respectively. Patients in group A with biopsy proven rejection had a higher mean two minute uptake of the administered dose of 4.3 plus or minus 0.5% as compared to 1.9 plus or minus 1% in those with rejection and that had a p-value of under 0.001. However, these findings were not supported by the results in group B and C. No patients in group A with abnormal ultrasound findings potentially indicative of rejection had biopsy proven rejection. So in terms of the second part of the study, um, the Spearman's rank order correlation showed a weak negative correlation between two minute uptake and both the three month serum creatinine and also the 12 month serum creatinine. That was statistically significant. So our results suggest that whilst having a normal post operative MAG3 perfusion of a renal graft has a reasonable negative predictive value for rejection, abnormal MAG3 perfusion was not helpful in differentiating rejection from moderate to severe ATN. The low specificity in our study is likely related to that severe ATN can also result in diminished perfusion, with early post operative inflammation or edema potentially causing a compartment effect. The low sensitivity in comparison to past older studies is likely to be related to that the incidence of acute rejection has approximately halved in the last decade due to better cross-match strategies and therapeutic um, immunosuppressive therapies. Whilst acute antibody-related um, mediated rejection, which happens days to week after transplant, still remains a major cause of graft loss, it is not surprising that early postoperative MAG3 on day zero to three is unable to preemptively predict this type of rejection, which has not yet had time to develop. The majority of our cohort also only underwent a single MAG3 study, and thus the utility of interval changes was unable to be assessed. 
In terms of the two minute to uptake, our findings showed that the value itself was not of use in terms of better differentiating rejection from ATN. Interestingly, however, the two minute uptake was seen to have a weak negative correlation with the three month and the 12 month serum creatinine. Thus, the higher the two minute uptake calculated, the lower the serum creatinine levels or better the renal function. Limitations of this study include the inherent weaknesses of any retrospective single centre study. Moreover, only a relatively small proportion of our patients underwent core biopsy within seven days, which makes it difficult to assess the true predictive value of scintigraphy using the biopsy findings as a gold standard. Other limitations include that some of the biopsies showed mixed findings of both ATN and rejection, and there's also the possibility of sampling error. Furthermore, each subject's final diagnosis was based purely on the biopsy pathology rather than the clinical diagnosis. So in conclusion, whilst normal MAG3 um, perfusion has a reasonable negative predictive value for rejection, abnormal MAG3 perfusion was unhelpful in differentiating um, rejection from moderate to severe ATN. The two minute uptake parameter showed no additional benefit in the identification of rejection but it appeared to have a weak negative correlation with the three month and 12 month serum creatinine, and thus this may have a role in the prediction of longer term graph function. And thank you. Are there any questions? It's a lot of renal biopsies. Um, in post-transplant patients, uh, so I'm guessing that the nephrologists have a reasonably low threshold for performing them in your institution, um, but there must have been patients who didn't go on to biopsy. Um, all of our patients under uh, that, that kidney care service have a surveillance biopsy at three months um, due to the potential of subclinical rejection, um, but as um, that's why they were divided into three groups for the analysis, because only a small amount of mm. that, 30 of about 105, went to biopsy under seven days. Um, they must have had clinical suspicion, whether it's rising creatinine or some other features um, that led them that way. So they must have been, um, they must have been patients in whom things weren't going well. Clinically, uh, yes. Now, it's a bit unfair to expect a test performed in the days following a transplant to predict late rejection months down the track because the pathophysiology just wouldn't have set in by then. Uh, so if we go back to the early phase studies, um, the ones who did have acute rejection, uh, it seems like the MAG3 scans weren't... I mean, were they more helpful than just monitoring the creatinine? Sorry, the, so I mean, if, 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 if you, yep. once you've, if you're checking the creatinine and doing a biopsy in the patients who have un, unsatisfactory creatinine pathways or trajectories, uh, does the MAG3 scan add anything to that? If the patients are all going on to a biopsy anyway, if their creatinines are no good? Um, I think it does help in a sense um, in terms of the amount of perfusion and it gives an idea whether things I think it's more helpful if it's normal, um, and again, it helps them as a supportive factor, um, whereas if it's clearly, no, as, maybe the other way, if it's clearly um, abnormal, then perhaps they're going to hinge more in that direction. I don't think it's a single defining factor by itself. I think they'd use it in combination with all the other features um, to help them in their decision making and treatment. Princess Alexandra in Brisbane, we are the sole transplant centre for the state of Queensland, so we transplant about 100 to 120 kidneys a year. And we're now only doing MAG3s in the ones that are not performing well post-transplant, so creatinine probably has some uh, benefit in tracking the function. But we've seen this more in the DCD donor patients, mm -hmm. and our transplant physicians are fairly aggressive at biopsying those, and there really is quite a, a difference in the pathologies detected, and a lot of times it is simply severe ATN, but the, the initial perfusion is significantly down on, on what it should have been in the start. And now they're tending to biopsy the ones that are not behaving in pairs. 
So if yep. they know where the second kidney went and it's working, then they biopsy the one that's not. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess one one of the un, one of the other findings is that it may not help them so much. Um, I guess in the direct postoperative period, but what we found is that it may actually have an indication of how they might go further on, and that was supported by other a few other findings um, uh, studies in the literature that how the baseline postoperative scintigraphy may also reflect how the kidney goes. In one study, um, they used different parameters, but up to five years in the future. Um, so in that regard, it stay, still may provide them um, pro, um, prognostic information. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>